Hello and welcome to this video on financial analysis. This is an introductory video on the role of financing. I will make two more videos about the role of financing, explicitly about the Modigliani-Miller irrelevance theory 1 and 2 as of 1958 and 1963. Nevertheless, let's make some assumptions about the role of financing. For this video, I planned the following. First of all, I would like to share some preliminary thoughts. Then I would like to go into the balance sheet and I would like to analyze what happens if we redecide about the financing of our company. Then I would like to go into the income statement and again analyze what happens if we redecide about our financing. And last but not least, I would like to analyze the cash flow calculation if we do the same redecision. Here are some preliminary thoughts about the financing of companies. How can we adjust the financing of our company? Of course, this is not as easy as it seems, but we have a lot of levers in our hand to change the financing of our company. First of all, of course, we could distribute more or we could distribute less dividend. If we distribute more dividend, of course, we do not strengthen our equity and we will need more debt financing in the future if we want to finance some new investments or whatsoever. If we distribute less dividend, we can retain our earnings and strengthen our equity. Accordingly, we need less debt in the future. Of course, we can make an equity increase. We can issue some shares or however we would like to do that. Of course, that strengthens our equity. What is not as easy as that is to decrease the equity. That is very unusual and that doesn't work that easy. So increase in equity is not day-to-day -day business, but we can see it quite often a decrease in equity is much more complicated. Of course, we can take new credit or we can pay back credit to adjust uh, the debt. Since we earn some cash from operations, we have to make decisions about the use of our cash. Um, of course, we can make investments or we can pay back credit, we can distribute more dividend, but of course only limit it up to the profits that we have. That's the natural ceiling of dividend distributions. The same is true for cash from death investments. So if we sell some assets or if we sell some shares of daughter companies or whatsoever, we have to decide about the use of cash here. I think the largest level that we have to redecide the financing of our company is to decide about the financing of M&A transactions or to other group related transactions, especially in large groups, it is much easier to change the financing when we sell or buy other companies. So, since these are the levers in our hand, what can we lever? In another video, I have already shown the leverage effect, and I would like to point out, and this is very important, that the leverage effect is not a theory. It is a fact. So if you change the leverage of your company, your company will earn a higher or lower return on equity. Of course, depending if your company 
is earning enough operating profit to cover its debt or to cover its uh, interest. Let's take a look at this formula. So the return on equity, ROE, return on equity, is determined by the return on capital employed plus this certain margin that we see, which is the return on capital employed minus the uh, risk-free interest rate or the interest rate on debt in this case times the leverage ratio, um, non-current liabilities divided by equity, or whatever abbreviation you like to take. So this is debt and this is equity. And the whole bracket here must be multiplied by 1 minus t, and t is the tax rate. Now, if we take a look here, we see the leverage, so the leverage ratio on the x-axis. The further we go right, the higher is the leverage ratio, the more debt we use in relation to equity. If now the return on capital employed, our operative result, is higher than the interest, so it does not only cover, but it exceeds uh, our interest expenditures, then this bracket is positive. And if this bracket is positive, of course we have a positive slope in our curve. Or, in other words, with the leverage ratio going up, the return on equity is going up as long as the return on capital employed exceeds the interest rate. In the vice versa situation, where the return on capital employed is lower than the interest rate, this bracket here becomes negative. And accordingly, the slope of our return on equity is becoming negative too. So, there's an upside and there's a downside of the leverage effect. As long as our company is stable and the return on equity is high enough, we can lever the return on equity up using more debt. But as soon as our co uh, company is getting weaker, our return on equity can also be levered downwards or even into losses as we see it here. As a model, let us assume that there are two completely identical companies, just like mirror-like fuel stations on both sides of the road. Here we have a fuel station, and here we have a fuel station, and this is a road to some city. So, in the morning, people are going into the city, and they will use this fuel station. In the evening, people are going outside, and they, they will use this fuel station. So, in total, both fuel stations earn exactly the same amount of operative income and of operative cash flow. Let us now assume that despite their operative income, one fuel station is indebted. So, debt is part of their financing. And one fuel station is not indebted, they are fully equity financed. Just as a model, what is the difference in financials between these two fuel stations? Please keep this model in uh, your memory, because we will come to back to that quite often. Now, what happens to the balance sheet if there is a change in the relation between debt and equity? First of course, f first of all, of course, we see the debt here, non-current liabilities, and the equity here, uh, total equity. Of course, we see a change in the debt ratio. 
or in the leverage ratio, um, that's mainly just a different writing or a different ratio, but telling the same story. Of course, we see a change in the ability to compensate losses. Companies with a higher total equity can more easily compensate losses. Companies with a low total equity might have problems to compensate losses or might be forced to file for insolvency. Accordingly, and due to the leverage effect, the leverage effect also inherits the leverage risk, we see a, risk, uh, a change in the risk st structure for both, for the shareholders and for the bondholders. For the bondholders, because the ability to compensate losses diminishes with equity. For the shareholders, because of the return on equity. As we see, the more leverage we use, the higher the return on equity can be or the lower. Accordingly, the volatility is going up. So, we see a change in risk structure for both, for shareholders and bondholders or banks. For bondholders, that means that there is a change in the creditworthiness. And since there's a change in the creditworthiness, bondholders and banks have to include expected losses into the interest they demand. So we see a change in the cost of debt. Taking credit will be more expensive the less total equity we have. But what about the change in cost of equity? And what about the change in company value? That is very, very important. So can we just buy a company, go up with leverage and sell it to a different price? Does that work out or doesn't it? We're coming to that question in one of the next videos. Now, what happens to the income statement if we decide differently about the usage of debt or equity? Since we don't see dividend payments in the income statement, we can only see interest expenses. But if we use more debt, of course, we see more interest expenses. So an increase in debt will lead to an increase in invest, uh, interest expenses. If the interest expenses go up, of course, the income before income taxes will decrease, it will go down. And since this is the tax base, the income tax will go down too. All after all, we will see a decrease in net income but not as much, because we see two effects. We see the direct effect on interest expense that goes up, and we see a slight effect uh, on the income taxes that goes down. So we see two uh, effects going into different directions. The one is larger, the other one is smaller, and both determine the, the net income. Let's come back to our fuel station. First, we take a look at the indebted fuel station or the indebted company that uses debt as part of its financing. This company, of course, has some interest expense and it has to pay some interest tax, uh, income taxes. Everyone has to do that, of course. Um, and there's an implicit corporate income tax, CIT, corporate income tax rate, of 23.5%. So that is 522 divided by 2,225. That's the implicit co corporate income tax that we see here. 
if we now assume the other fuel station, how would the other fuel station look alike? Now here we see the income statement of the non-indebted company, so of the fully equity financed, let's, let's say, fuel station. Since this company does not use any debt for financing, they do not have to pay an interest expense. Since there is no interest expense, the income before taxes, of course, is higher. And since the income before income taxes, which is the tax base, is higher, the income taxes have to be higher too. And thus, the in consolidated net income is higher because the interest expense effect is the larger effect. Nevertheless, there is this counter effect on the income taxes. We now call these income taxes for the non-debted company adjusted tax. So, if our starting point is the indebted company and we would like to assume that how would this company would look like if it was non-indebted, we call the income taxes adjusted tax. Based on these assumptions, there are several new indicators um, that we should know. The first is the so-called net operating profit after tax, or NOPAT. The NOPAT is for indebted companies. What is the NOPAT? The NOPAT is the operating income, that's why it's called net operating profit, so the EBIT. After tax, so the income tax has to be deducted, and that's the NOPAT. Why is this indicator calculated? Because it is comparable to other companies. Uh, is it really? No, it is not. Because in this income tax, this income tax is not adjusted for financing. So still the effect of debt is inherited in this income tax. So this is my opinion. The no pet net operating profit after tax is complete nonsense. Nevertheless, I have to teach it because it's in the textbooks. The better version is the so-called no plat, net operating profit less adjusted tax. It also starts with the operating income, but it deducts the adjusted tax. We can do this for both, for the indebted company as well as for the non-indebted company, of course. If we want to calculate it for the indebted company, EBIT is still the same, and we adjust the tax and deduct it, so we get the no plat net operating profit less adjusted tax. The difference, of course, is the so-called tax shield. So the adjusted tax minus the income tax is the tax shield, which is here 66. So you save 66 million euro in this case because you are indebted. What happens to the cash flow calculation if you redecide about your financing? Well, it's easy to say so because the profit and loss or the income statement is an integral part of the cash flow calculations. So all changes in the profit will also be reflected in the cash flow from operations. And since this is part of the total cash flow, also in the total cash flow. And all others that we see here, all other figures are not affected. Let us again make the assumption about the indebted company and the non-indebted company. Of course, I have adjusted 
all those figures in line with all the previous figures. So the profit of the financial year is higher if you do not use debt. And accordingly, the cash flow from operations is higher and the total cash flow is higher. The difference here, of course, is the interest payment and uh, the tax shield. So you don't have to pay interest, but you don't get the, the tax shield here. There is a certain definition that we also should know, and that is the free cash flow. The free cash flow is the cash flow that can be used for the distribution to all investors, not only to the shareholders, but also to the bondholders. So the free cash flow should cover all cash flows due to interest and due to dividend. The free cash flow for the indebted company, for this one, is pretty easy to calculate because it's the cash flow from operations and the cash flow from investments. This one plus this one because both have to cover the cash flow from financing. Accordingly, this is the cash flow definition that is used before financing. For the non-indebted company, of course, we can also use the cash flow from operations that has been changed here and the cash flow from investments. Accordingly, we see a bit a different free cash flow. But if we now want to calculate for an indebted company the free cash flow and pretend as if this company was non-indebted, we have to use a different path. So, if we want to pretend that the indebted company was non-indebted, would not use any uh, debt, we would have to calculate the cash flow from operations that we see here, plus the interest expenses, since we have to pretend that the indebted company does not use debt. So we have to add the interest again. We have to add the income taxes again, because we have to adjust them. They're in here, of course. Uh, we have to add them. And we have to deduct the income taxes from the non-indebted company. And again, of course, we have to add the cash flow from investments. What do we do here? We correct for the tax shield. Since we now have analyzed the financials of our company, a bunch of differences is now obvious to us. And that's quite a lot. Nevertheless, two further questions are yet unsolved. Is there a change in the cost of equity? And is there a change in company value? A solution for these two questions was proposed by Franco Modigliani and Merton H. Miller, who both won the Nobel Prize, Franco Modigliani in 1985 and Miller in 1990, together with Markowitz and Sharp. Um, in 1958, both proposed, based on an arbitrage uh, proof, that there is no difference in company value, which is their proposition number one. They proved that the cost of equity increases with leverage, parallel to the return on equity, and in fact, this is the reason why there is no difference in company value, because the company earns more, but also the shareholders expect more. So both is going up with leverage. And the weighted average cost of capital, the WEC, is constant with leverage. This is their proposition number three. 
And since there is no relevance in the financing policy, it is called the irrelevance theorem of financing policy, or the Modigliani-Miller theorem without taxes. Why was without taxes? Because there's another one with taxes. We have to talk about that in a second. In 1961, both proved that under certain under the same assumptions, like in 1958, um, the dividend policy doesn't play a role too. So it doesn't matter how high the dividend is. There is no effect on company value, there is no effect on cost of capital, and so on and so forth. So this is called the irrelevance of dividend policy or irrelevance theorem of dividend policy, however you like to put it. And in 1963, they published another analysis, um, which they called a correction, but of course it was not a correction, it was a different analysis. Um, that there is a different difference in company value that is driven by the tax shields. The tax shields cannot be replicated by arbitrage, and in fact, the higher, the more debt you use, the higher will be the, comp uh, the company value due to the tax shield. So this is called the Modigliani-Miller theorem without taxes. Thanks for listening to this video. See you in the next video.